Hello, David Zaritsky for The Bond Experience. Welcome back. You know that we've been doing a series where we've been connecting artists, but they're not just any artists. They're artists that really have done something with Bond. And I am so excited because this is a gentleman who has, I don't use this word lightly, elevated my channel significantly. And I'm, I'm saying using other people's words too. Marcus Mills, welcome to the show. Hi, David. How are you? I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Good, good. So am I. You could say it's, it's been quite a long time coming for, from my perspective. Absolutely. Um, we've, we've kind of passed each other and, and connected. But yeah, sorry. What, what, do, what do you mean by that? <laughs> oh, uh, well, I've been watching your channel for, oof. Uh, I remember the Quantum of Solace haircut video. Oh my gosh. Um, wow. So I remember 2008. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a long time since, uh, I never thought I'd get involved in the community uh, at all, really. I was kind of a consumer more than anything. I remember watching a lot of your videos, specifically being on the MI6 forum, um, watching Tom Wildak's videos, which yeah. I thought were absolutely incredible. Um, so I was aware quite early on that there was a lot of creativity um, in the community, and I never thought that I'd be at all involved. But as you said, our paths have kind of crisscrossed recently and uh, it's, it's nice that it's we've got to this position where we're kind of in a way sort of collaborating together absolutely I, I would exactly use that word I think it has been an incredible collaboration and and I should explain a little bit is that um, you know I know that you are in the industry I use my little rabbit ears but um, truly you know one point you had reached out to me and said, listen, I don't want to offend anyone. However, um, I can work on your thumbnails, you know, the actual images that go on the YouTube channel. And I said, my gosh, you're not offending anybody. 90% of the time I'm doing them myself. And quite frankly, not very well. I'm cobbling things together. And I thought, you know, you were going to do a nice picture and it'd be, it'd be very appreciated. And then you blew everybody away. I mean, you started to do like mini paintings. So first of all, where does this passion come from to do this? Uh, well, I've always been sort of creative. Um, I'm, uh, well, I sort of consider myself a filmmaker or aspiring filmmaker, shall we say, but I've always been fascinated with um, photography. I took photography, uh, for my A-levels in, uh, in England. And um, I mean, if you're, if, I mean, as you say, film is how many frames per second, it all begins with photography. Mm -hmm. And if you can distill something into an image, um, then, you know, you're, you're on your way to, to making something of a good film. Um, I, I've always been fascinated with, with, with film photography. I was born, in Buckinghamshire. Uh, I was born near a village uh, called, called Great Missenden. Um, funnily enough, Great Missenden is actually quite renowned for being the birth, well, not the birthplace, but uh, Roald Dahl took residence there and oh, was yeah. sort of considered the celebrity of the village. Uh, and as I was growing up, they actually built um, a museum dedicated for yeah. him. And every day I'd um, I'd go to uh, I go to school on my walk. I'd always pass uh, his little writing huts, which which was quite famous for basically he he'd leave the the hectic freneticism of his house and he'd go into his little writing sheds where he could kind of be isolated and do his work. Um, and of course Buckinghamshire as well, um, being home to Pinewood Studios. Mm -hmm. um, also, when I got a little older, I found out about Leafston Studios, which was more of a recent development. Funnily enough, that has its own heritage with Bond. Um, Goldeneye, uh, basically, for some reason or other, they couldn't film at Pinewood. And Leafston began as a Rolls-Royce factory. And um, 
they decided to convert it into a sort of mini studios. And Warner Brothers came along, and I think it's most known for uh, the Harry Potter franchise. And then Warner Brothers bought it, I think, in 2013, and now it's Warner Brothers Studios. Anyway, long story short, I just feel like I was brought up in this creative hub. There was a lot of inspiration going around, and I really wanted to be involved in that. Early on, you know, obviously film being a collaborative process and whatnot, it's about being surrounded by good people that, I think, as you said, elevate what you are and your work. And it can be kind of hard to find like-minded people like that, especially when you're sort of at secondary school, you're still quite young. So I found photography being probably the best you can get in terms of sort of stepping into the film world whilst, you know, not having too much resting on your shoulders, shall we say. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously part of that, I started to learn about Photoshop, the editing uh, software, and what you can do to an image. Um, and that sort of started the ball rolling, really. Um, I remember doing uh, a lot of Bond art around that time. I had, I think a lot of people back then had a Deviant Art account. Yeah. Where I, I don't know what the, I think that's still running, I don't know what the equivalent of that would be now. Um, but I did a fair bit of, of work on there. I also consumed a lot of Doctor Who, as you kind of do when uh, you live in England. Um, so funnily enough, Doctor Who and, and Bond, to arguably some of the biggest aspects of British pop culture, I was producing like artwork for, for myself, really, um, just because I enjoyed it. And um, that's been that, really. It's been something I've kind of delved into every now and again. But uh, I think one of the reasons why I reached out to you was being in this period of lockdown. It's kind of galvanized some people in a way in which going back to things that they kind of put on the back burner or, or put aside or didn't think it was an endeavor worthwhile or, or something like that. Um, and it's amazing what you're capable of doing on your own. So it's almost like reverting back to my younger self in secondary school, learning the kind of techniques that kind of keep you sane when you're on your own. Um, and obviously there's aspects of filmmaking that you're able to do by yourself. But um, just getting back out there. Um, so basically what I, what I do for my work is I have, a touchpad and a stylus, which allows me to use the pen tool to kind of crop out people quite easily. Um, so I, I bought one of those, um, which are very uh, quite affordable. And um, I just started doing little projects. There was that um, Bond art project um, mm-hmm. that uh, I think Creative Talent or or some sort of website right. created. Uh, and that was the first thing I'd done in ages. And I think now that I had the, you know, the tools and the software, um, well, really, I thought I bought a one-month trial of uh, Adobe Creative. I actually bought a year's subscription. Oh, my gosh. So you had to use it. Yeah, exactly. But that's worked out for the best, really. Um, and... And yeah, I reached out to you, I think especially because what was apparent to me is that you've been doing something similar in in your situation of lockdown, making the best of things. Um, And, you know, you had Operation Phoenix, Operation Freefall, all these little mini collaborations together. And, you know, I thought, you know, why not? Why not? try and see if I can contribute or, or help out. Um, seeing what really stunned me was um, the Operation Phoenix uh, little intro video that I understand was done by Joe Darlington. Yes. Which I thought was incredible. It was so polished and and uh, especially you had your interview with David Williams as well to follow. 
it was just, I think we've all come along leagues um, from where we started off. And, and um, yeah, I've rambled on for a long time. Maybe you should interject. No. No, 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 no. This is great because you're, you're, listen, you're a filmmaker and a filmmaker is a storyteller and it's part of what you've brought to the table, even with doing the collaborations with me, because I don't think people, and I want to go back a little bit. I don't think people realize something about thumbnails and I'm going to just stay on that for a moment because thumbnails are literally the size of a postage stamp, sometimes even smaller if it's on a phone. So when somebody sees it literally, you've got to tell a story in a very finite amount of time, meaning seconds. And, and you and I kind of, you know, we, we co-educated each other. Um, I remember you had done these amazing, amazing images. And I said, Marcus, this is a beautiful painting. If it was this big, this would be the most amazing thing. I said, but it, there are certain things that a thumbnail needs to do. First of all, it needs to connect back to the channel. Um, it also needs to really tell them very quickly what it is. So if it's a product, that product has to be highlighted and has to be there. Or if it's a conversation with Joe Darlington, he's got to be prominently there. He can't. And so I think you got uh, tsunamied by an incredible amount of uh, creative brief feedback and all these different things about what a thumbnail can be, because I can imagine you're working on a pad but then you've got to think about your image is actually going to go to like that. How difficult was that for you? Um, well, to begin with, uh, quite a bit actually. Um, like you said, you kind of, you have a large canvas in mind. So from sort of my earlier artworks, I do something in sort of dimensions of a film poster. Um, and as you, can, as you understand the sort of, I guess those sort of posters, the floating heads, um, what you kind of get with something like Star Wars, where there's mm. a lot crammed into one, specifically the, the Force Awakens poster. There's a lot of elements that go into that. Um, I was kind of drawing inspiration from, from those sort of artworks. And as you say, it all gets condensed down. Um, so you basically when you when you make limitations like that i mean that's what being creative is all about you've got to work within the confines and the limitations and uh, to begin with there might be a bit of a push and pull because you've got to work with that new format or or that new sort of medium or way of doing things and it's not an easy medium it, it, there's a lot of um well, what I tried to do was I tried to find a sort of happy medium or a balance between producing something that I thought was, had a kind of painterly quality, had a mm. kind of, um, I wanted to have a sort of 60s, 70s Bond style artwork kind of vintage feel to it. Um, but then also uh, honoring everything else that a thumbnail needs to be. So for example, needs to contain all the elements. Uh, it needs to, you know, wants, you need, you need to want someone to click on it. Um, and that has its own things, issues as well, because I think you find there's this element of uh, clickbait, yeah. which does the runs around YouTube. Um, specifically where I think you see that little red circle in an image and you think by clicking on it, you'll find out that little thing that you missed or something like that, a little detail when you watch a film or, or a photo or something. So I wanted to do something that didn't resort to that, but as I said, kind of, you know, it's sort of a happy balance, a happy medium. And I think, I like to think that we're, more or less there now. There's still a little bit of push and pull, but you know, um, I guess that's the beauty of it really, is that having that conversation and knowing that back and forth with each other. I mean, it's not just like I make one artwork and it gets approved. There, There's a process behind it. And I, I enjoy it because I want to produce something that you're happy and satisfied with. Um, and I think 
I think from your perspective as well, during this process, you felt more able to hand out a little bit of creative criticism. Well, it's always so detrimental. You know, to, for me, it's difficult because, you know, you're doing this, you're raising your hand and you're saying, David, I'd, I'd love to do this with you. This might be fun. And so it's it's a friend doing it with a friend. So to give constructive criticism or feedback, which I'm used to doing in my real world and running an agency, um, is difficult because I know as a creative person, you know, you're you're very good about it, but it's also, well... You, you you weren't quite on target. And I want to I want to paint a picture, excuse the pun, for people because I don't want people to think for a moment, like I get on the phone with you or I give you two pages of notes and go do it. Do it exactly like this. I want Roger Moore's pinky up in the air and I want his brow furred. Literally, you have car blanche, excuse the pun. You have car blanche because I say, here's what it's about. Here's a couple images. Let me know what you got. <laughs> and yeah. and that's why I think it's so wonderful because you do, you come up with these things like even the Goldfinger discussion. Oh my gosh, you know, where I'm flying out of the roof and Joe Darlington's dri driving the DB5. I mean, people were freaking out, but I was freaking out because, you know, I'd never said that. You know, you came up with that entirely on your own and it was just amazing to watch. Yeah, I, well, funnily enough, um, you're aware of it. Um, I don't think anyone else is. But that began as something entirely different. Uh, that began as, as I think I mentioned earlier on, that sort of floating head montage thing, where I kind of delivered something to you that was more of a like a quad style film poster. And obviously, all of that is going to get lost because there's so many elements uh, that are kind of juggling for your attention. Um, and I think that was one of the conversations that we had that really made me kind of wake up to what this is all about, really, which is trying to, I guess, condense down what your brand is into, into something of such a small size. So I, I think I recall you mentioning you wanted something quite frivolous, something quite comedic. Um, a little tongue-in-cheek, a little humorous, not taking oneself too seriously, which I can appreciate. Right. Because I imagine, well, with with the um, uh, channel with its content about Bond clothing, I guess in anyone else's hands, it could perhaps run the risk of being a little bit pompous or a little bit, you know, um, overly serious, you know, and, and, you know, yeah. It's, it's almost in a way, I guess, how Terence Young and, and Sean Connery kind of molded the role really was injecting a sense of humor. Um, and I think you've, you've done that really successfully and you've, you've educated me on, on how to approach because I think there was the risk of me kind of, making something that is so, I don't know what the right word would be, uh, a little bit too much, it might run the risk of uh, not tarnishing your brand, but maybe making it out to be something a little bit, thinking a little bit too highly or, or elevating you in a, in a non, in a non good way. So right. by hearing from you how you want to be, uh, represented, um, you know, with all the, those kind of adjectives that I mentioned, that that brought upon, I, I, I was very happy because, as you mentioned, that wasn't a brief you gave me about the ejector seat and whatnot. That was just something I thought, oh, in the film, perfect, that represents everything. You got the little humorous touch of, of Joe being the driver's seat ejecting you, so we got a sense of your um, relationship with each other and that sense of fun. Plus, it's quite a dynamic image, and it kind of, yes. forgive me, but I, the name escapes me, the many artists of those early Bond posters. Um, oh, um, McGuinness. Yes, yes. Um, and there's that You Only Live Twice poster where Connery is scaling the set. 
Yes. And yes. all sense of like geography and and um, gravity is just completely thrown out the window. And then you've got that one of Roger Moore on the Golden Gate Bridge. I was trying to almost where the actual landscape kind of curves in on itself and sections of the image are like elongated and stretched to kind of create that sort of dynamic look. That's something that I wanted to kind of inject um, into, into that image and, and, and several others. So, um, yeah, it, it's been, I've enjoyed the push and pull. I think you're not going to learn anything unless there's any, anything of that. And throughout the process, we could have easily just been like, you know, I'm not willing to, you know, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or like bend my, my way I do things. So, yeah, well, that was the other thing, too. It's that, and I found this, I don't know, what, maybe it's the Bond community, but artists in the Bond community are not the type where it's like, you know, how dare you? You know, this is my art, damn it. You know, they're actually very, in a way, self-deprecating, which is makes it very humble. Um, that was the thing that I told you about my channel. You know, you have to be careful when you talk about Aston Martins and Omega watches you have to be self-deprecating. You have to make fun of yourself. You have to mispronounce things and make fun of yourself and, and make mistakes and make fun of yourself. So when we went back to the thumbnail and I said, have fun with it, make, make me a goofball. You know, that's kind of the theme of this thing. It's, it's not, it's not, Oh, you know, look at him. It's, it's an emulation thing. It's, Oh, look at him. He's having fun. He's making mistakes. He's fallible like bond. Bond is an, a fallible anti-hero, so, and you, you're doing that wonderfully. Yeah, you don't want to, like, like we discussed earlier, take yourself too seriously. You don't want to be a, a Patrick Bateman type S character where you take, you know, all these things to the third degree, um, but take it with a, with a little bit of, well, Roger Moore, I guess, a little bit of tongue-in-cheek eyebrow raise, you know. Um, about these things and I think it makes I don't know would you feel like that's because obviously you've got these brands um, very sophisticated brands you're dealing with I guess things that people take really seriously um, and I guess that's in a way to sort of counteract that because when you talk about I guess in general, when you talk about brands, when you talk about company names and designers, it can, in a way, almost become a little bit stuffy, mm. and that kind of pomposity again. And I think, as you said, the way you do things, just do it with a bit of lightheartedness, and and not. I mean, I'm sure the brands themselves don't take themselves too seriously either. But I think some of the people that consume those brands possibly might. They might. Um, we don't hang yeah. out with those type of people, though. No, no, no. no and by the no, way, it's, it's, uh, the word that really always comes to mind when I do these videos, especially around the brands, is discovery. You know, it's, it's this yearn to discover something new. And I think a lot of people, they tend to gravitate to them sometimes because Honestly, they have no intention of getting the product, but they're curious about it. They want to see more of it. They want to see how it fits or what it looks like or, you know, what, how did they wrap it? You know, that's to me very fascinating, this whole unboxing thing, you know, 52 year old unboxing is, but they love that. Yeah. Well, funny enough, I was, I'm one of those people. Uh, I wasn't going to go to the hairdressers and ask for a, a quantum of solace haircut. Or I wasn't going to go, well, funny you should mention this, actually. Um, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it was yourself. Um, I have one element of Bond clothing in my wardrobe. Mm. And, and this was way early on when I was <clears throat> in secondary school, like I mentioned earlier. The most successful thing to me that I could buy was the Sunspell Navy blue shirt from Casino Royale. Um, and... I got that and loved the hell out of it. It was very, very comfortable, very form fitting. It's kind of similar to the way it rests on you, what you're wearing now, in a way. Um, and 
that was that was thanks thanks to you kind of oh. allowing us sort of to go behind the curtain if you will um and yeah it, it was all fun you know um and obviously still to this day continue to enjoy your content and you're putting out a lot of content um i almost think how how do you keep doing it and keeping it fresh and interesting because I, I don't can, sleep <laughs> Like a dream machine somewhere. Exactly. Well, I, I tell you, it's interesting because I have this conversation with friends all the time. Um, I'll have some people who are also content creators who are good friends of mine say, man, I hit a wall. I just, I hit a wall. I don't know what to do next. I reviewed all the movies. I've done this. I don't know what to do. Honestly, my biggest issue is I have a monster list of things I want to do. Um, and then what happens is that list gets bombarded by new brand stuff coming out and things showing up and all of a sudden that list gets even longer. So I don't have any want of um, ideas. It's time, you know, and, and I think you know this all too well because you're making thumbnails for them. But, you know, I'll very often have two, more often three videos a week, which is, it's like a studio show at this point. Um, they're not high glossy, but they're, they're, there's content there. So I think a part of that is not me saying to myself, oh, I need three, I need three. It's more like I need to get it out of me. You know, as a creator, sometimes you have that yearn to get something out there. And, and I think you probably have the same thing. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. Because I don't know how long your channel's been going on for. And I don't know if that's something you like to not know yourself. But... Uh... <laughs> I imagine it's something along, yeah, along the lines of almost a decade or more. It's almost ten years. Yeah, yeah. We have to do a poster. Uh, absolutely, yeah. You have to tell me the exact date, and I'll, I'll cook that up. For you got you. it. Um, it is. It is incredible, really. Um, I suppose a lot of it's got to do with the community itself, because so many of your videos are collaborations with others, and conversations with others. Um, which I've appreciated about your work is your whilst whilst you're kind of the central character, I suppose, if you will, is always an ensemble. It's it's you're you're never taking, you know, the central sort of the spotlight for too long. And you're always willing to share it with others and, and illuminate them and case in point is what you're doing right now. Um, and I think that there's a lot to be said about someone that's, that's willing to use their platform and their channel to, as you mentioned about earlier about discoveries, discover other people. And um, I think that's something that I've especially noticed this year um, with yourself is, is that sort of generosity of, as to allowing others to kind of, you know, enjoy um what you've managed to do for yourself but never for once taking full credit you know um, oh, thank you. i mean i i love people having the spotlight and it's not it's not to give them a boost of ego or even confidence it's really because i want to celebrate them i mean even this you and i talking today um you know i I've, I've interviewed for this art series uh reuben wakeman you know, uh, a gentleman called uh, Sungwon Huang. Um, and obviously, you know, we did Billy's Bond art. And, and the reason I've gone out to people like you and them, even in the art series, is because I really felt the need to celebrate you guys because, you know, you're humble, you're wonderful, you're talented beyond means. And for me, it's a celebration. It's not, oh my gosh, you know, I've got to, I've got to put a spotlight over here. Done. It's, more like you know just putting your friends up on your shoulders and having mm. fun so we, we mentioned kind of earlier I don't, I don't mean to like derail where this might have mm. been going but um we mentioned earlier that i kind of have a, a foot within the industry if you will if, if you wanted me to maybe talk a little bit more about that um, if, if you don't mind that would be amazing yeah i mean obviously obviously um, so I, I've been very fortunate enough to after, so I went to university 
um, and, and did a, got a first class honors in film and TV production. Um, and um, it took about six months after graduating from university to just emailing and emailing and emailing as many people as I could come across trying to come across an email address of some uh, crew member in some various department, you know, it is very much like uh, an exclusive club. Mm. Very hard to gain entry. And it's not the kind of entry in which your expertise will get you in. It's, it's a lot of it's rubbing shoulders and knowing people and, and all of that. Um, and... Luckily enough, a job presented itself, and I did that, and thankfully it's had a sort of domino effect. Since then, there's obviously been moments of drought where you kind of put your head in your hands and you're like, God, is, is this worth it? Is it worth kind of going through this patch of just like nothing while seeing other people working, I guess, in more conventional jobs mm -hmm. consistently? And in enjoying the the rewards of that, uh, I think only a certain kind of person's built for this kind of lifestyle. And I've questioned myself, you know. But it's it's those moments when, say, I guess you you happen to be on the 007 stage at Pinewood, and you're pay, you're being paid to be there, uh, and you just kind of got to step back a little and, and pause and just be, thank your lucky stars, you know. You might be here, you might not be in that position that you'd like to be, but you're in this environment, you're in this, within these four walls, you know. So I think when it comes to the industry, there's a big aspect of trying to get up that ladder and it is a very stressful environment, full of a lot of, you know, because you never know when your next job's going to be after you've, yeah. after you've done it. But I think you've just got to enjoy the ride as much as you can. Um, um, and that's sort of where I come from in, in, in terms of the industry. I've been very fortunate enough to work on quite a, quite a large amount of um, studio features. In, in various capacities um, and I think a lot of a lot of being able to ride that terrain is in your own time being creative um, funnily enough when you're on a set it is, to a lot of people it is a job and it's kind of hard to get your head around that that there's people that have been in this industry for for decades and you know it's it's a job to them and they might not look at it in the same way that you would. Um, they might, their, their concerns might not be your concerns. So it's just, it's just a very interesting journey, this working in film. And as I mentioned before, it, it's, it's doing these creative things in your own time that kind of make all that hardship tolerable. And, you know, being on a set and being like, I guess, at ground zero, and, and you one day hoping to maybe be in charge of, of a set. It's doing these creative things in your own time, doing your own productions, doing these little things here and there. Um, I remember one story where um, uh, basically on, on sets you have this thing called Video Village, where you have all the, monitor, the feedback monitors and that you have uh, what well, we, we kind of got the term easy ups, which are these little tents that kind of house all these electronics and, and monitors and that for all the departments to be able to look back at the live feed. So you've got hair and makeup in one, um, you've got the DOP's tent in one, and along a lot of many of my jobs, my job has been to build those um, in, in order to house those departments and kind of facilitate them, look after them. And quite recently, Back last year, I kind of delved into making another short film after a period of drought. Um, and I hired a cinematographer and whatnot. And he built, out of a C-stand, uh, a monitor, a feedback monitor, 
he, he essentially built me my own little mini video village. Uh, and it's incredible being able to be both sort of, to be financially, uh, to make, you know, I guess, rent money and bills and whatnot through an industry that you enjoy and love and want to be involved in. Uh, and in your own time, creatively being fulfilled by being in that. And just just those, those little moments, you know, of just, I, I'm used to building this for someone else, and then suddenly someone's doing it for me. I think it's important that to retain that sort of humbleness. Uh, and I think a lot of that does come through starting from the bottom and working your way up. Um, Absolutely. And by the way, in, in many industries, it's like that as well. I, and I think the others around you have a lot more respect. I mean, the fact that, you know, someday when you walk on a set, a big set, and, you know, you are the director or whatever you aspire to be, and they know that you've done all those things. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they'll absolutely doff their hat to you, of course. Yeah, I mean... I, I've seen where there are some directors um, in in less capacities as such as in um, uh, studio features, but in any kind of fair, seeing not and like you said, it doesn't have to just be in a film environment. It can be in any sort of working environment. Seeing, um, uh, I, like I said, a director. Um, kind of feeling uncomfortable being surrounded by other people, as in other departments. And I think a lot of that comes through not knowing what they do and that uncomfortableness about steering a ship and having a crew that you're not entirely sure what they're actually doing mm. or performing. And I think a lot of working your way from the ground up you familiarize yourself with all these people and empathize with all these other departments to be in a position in which you are steering a ship or a boat that you know it from like the back of your hand and it must be you must feel so much more at ease working with all these other departments knowing what they do knowing who they are I mean I, I've seen directors like this and, and it's incredible uh, to compare them to maybe say other ones that uh, I guess haven't had that kind of journey or process and and just kind of, well, not happening upon it, but kind of getting to that position in, in mm -hmm. a different way. It, it, it's, it's very interesting. And um, like you said, it, it's applicable to lots of different working environments. Um, I don't know exactly how you know, your working environment is, but um, it's interesting how this conversation has gone to um, this sort of realm about working environments, obviously, that are a lot different now in, in our sort of context at the moment. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're work from home situation almost universally around here, but um, yeah, it's very collaborative. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of everybody... One, one of the things that res resonated with what you just said was, you know, I find myself, if there's something on the floor and it needs to be picked up, I pick it up. It's not, you know, I don't pull my title out and throw it in somebody's face. You know, you've got to do, you've got to do it all. And like you said, you have to have a sense of humbleness about it as well. Yeah. I mean, God forbid you ever get to that stage where you're incapable of doing the little things like that. Um, and it, in a way has a has a counter effect where you become dependent on mm. others um, which I wouldn't in, enjoy at all and and I think you almost there, there's that sort of babysitting aspect yeah. where you almost start to become sort of child if you're being weighted on hand and foot like that and I think there is a negative aspect to, to these, uh, I guess, industries where um, that can happen. And, and I, I think it's important to, I guess, you have to be a certain kind of character, I guess, to 
enter an industry and then end up being like that. So I, I just think it's it's all about it's all about positivity, all about knowing where you are, where you've come from, who you're rubbing shoulders with, who's just on the first step of that journey that you took. Um, and it's funny as well, almost looking back on yourself in a way, mentioning earlier that I remember watching your videos from 10 years ago. Um, and looking back at the con sort of content that I produced back then as well, and, and seeing the kind of trajectory, the learning, the maturing that you do uh, in life and in, 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 your, in your field of work as well, uh, I think there's a lot to be said about being able to reflect upon that um, and not be too filled with with despair that is inherent with, I guess, the creative industries. It's, um, it comes with the turf and I think it's important to just take pause, look back and reflect and, and what sort of better context to do that in than 2020. Yeah. Uh, um, 2020, I guess, is, is the year for doing things yourself um, and, I guess, not becoming those sort of people that relies or waits on hand and foot. And those kind of people as well, you'd like to think, would learn something from this year. Um, but, um, I mean, I've discussed this with you before over the phone, but I think there's a lot to glean from this year in a positive aspects and i think especially the, the creative industries the the creative work such as this uh, I guess video series is trying to to shed light on as well as um i mean there's the collaborative efforts of like film industries and whatnot and theater that aren't having a good time of it at all yeah. um and i guess we're fortunate that those producing work for I guess writing and, and, and painting and stuff like that, you can do it on your own. But there's other industries out there, creative industries that are suffering and there's things that can be done to try and alleviate some of that strain. Um, I mean, there's a lot of difference between, I, I think, Britain and, and America at the moment. Um, yeah. For example, I've gone to see Tenet four times at the cinema and I'm still not proud of it. Um, and I know Tenet is this big studio feature, but in a way it almost feels like an indie at the moment because it's dependent upon you going to see it. Yeah. Um, and sort of feeding into No Time to Die, um, where we are at right now. Um, God, it's hard to imagine Quantum of Solace came out 12 years ago now. But um, there's a lot riding on on um, no time to die. Yeah, it's 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 a nail biter even over here because I mean you know this uh, tenant only did six million for the whole U.S. last weekend, weekend before that, which was a four day weekend. It did twelve. Uh, it's not doing well because people just really aren't going back to the theaters even when they're opened up here in the United States. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, just to be totally transparent with you, every day I wake up and I'm wondering, is this the day, you know, that they delay or, you know, say it's VOD and I, I, I really do like you want to see it in cinemas. Yeah, well, thankfully, uh, Tenet's done, I think, a little bit better in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the figures... For, for the UK have been actually fairly positive considering. Um, and I know the Americans a huge market and we're kind of small fry compared to that. But when it comes to No Time to Die, the US market less so. I think I read an article um, where the, the US market makes up about 25% of the yeah. gross of the Bond film. So it's less dependent on the US market. Um, I think I think No Time to Die has had an incredible production history. It has had so much um, hardship and, and problems, and you can see as well all the films um, slated for for the end of the year are all shuffling except No Time to Die. I think the only one left is Black Widow that still 
has a release date before Bond, being the only temp call from before Bond. And there's talk of that moving as well. So you just got to think, you know, maybe after all it's been through, maybe there is light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe it, because Tenet as well is quite a cerebral film and not necessarily one for the masses. Right. I think something like Bond, I, I really hope it, it comes at the right time. I, I really do feel like maybe going back to the old ways, going back to a series that's, you know, gone on for so long to, to entice people to go back. So I, I just think if, if it all works out well and, and, it does, and it does release in November, and maybe it's a case of uh, obviously the opening weekends is a thing of the past now. It's it's about the long haul. Hopefully, hopefully it'll run its course and it will it will do well. And I think what kind of a fitting end to the whole um, nail biting sort of yeah. uh, story it has been on its way to release. So. So we need Bond to come to the rescue. That's what this means. That's what a what an amazing thought. Well, listen, yeah. Mark Marcus. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming on. I feel like we've taken a journey. We've talked about the artwork, the thumbnails. We've got your your vocational history. You know your opinion on Bond and how it could literally save the day of cinema, which is. Uh, would be amazing. I mean, what a, what a historical moment that would be. But thank you so much for everything you do. I I, I truly appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. And, and you know, I, I appreciate working with you and having an outlet and, and, and having that sort of working relationship that will hopefully, hopefully continue. It's nice to have a foot within, within the community and, and being able to produce stuff for it and getting lovely messages from people within that community that I enjoyed watching and, and, and almost feeling like I'm one with I'm one with the club, I'm one with the gang. So I really appreciate that and I appreciate um this series um where you're where you're um just as you said, propping people up on, on your shoulder as friends and um and allowing them to talk about their work and celebrating their work. So I appreciate that. And I also enjoyed watching uh Billy's interview as well. I think his artwork yeah, he's a great guy. You're all great guys, though. Well, listen, Marcus Mills, thank you so much. This has been David Zaritsky for The Bond Experience, and we will see you all real soon. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from The Bond Experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information, plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you, just because we know you. Talk to you soon.